As Jesus is sending his disciples out into the world, this is his last pep talk to them. This is his last like set of suggestions, recommendations, commandments. Right? And he says to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded, and remember, I am with you always. This is what we call the Great Commission, and it is the basis for what we're going to talk about today. I think it's important to first note what happens on either side of it, right? The go first starts with Jesus saying, I have been given all authority. Which is kind of a reminder, the disciples already knew this, but it's a reminder that it's going to work out, the kingdom of God is coming, Jesus is, going, is on the throne, it's going to be, it's, that's how it's going to happen. And so first Jesus reminds them, when you go forth to do this, it's going to work. Right? It might not work out how you expect, but like this is like telling a team that's about to go out on the field and play, you're going to win. How would you play if you were absolutely certain that you were going to win? Right? Does that change how much confidence you play with? Right? And so before you go out to make disciples and baptize people, let's, let's, you just need to hear one more time. It's going to work. Right? All authority has been given to me. In the end, you're going, this, you're, this team is going to win. It's going to work out. And on the other side of saying, go, go therefore now and make disciples and baptize, Jesus says, and you'll never do it alone. I am with you always. And so this is what Jesus leaves his disciples with. Now, of all the people that have ever lived, who are the people who would best be prepared to do exactly what Jesus has told them to do, and to do it immediately, right? It'd be the disciples. They, they have seen Jesus at work. They know the score. They have followed him. They have committed their lives to him. They are the ones who are prepared to immediately just jump up and say, Yes, Jesus. We're going to go. We're going to do this. We're going to make some plans. We're going to go out. We're going to figure out how we're going to start going to all the nations. And we'll start here. And, and is that what happens? Nope. Not at all. Like, if you were go into the book of Acts, which is what happens after the Gospels, what you find there is the disciples take the Great Commission, go therefore, and they immediately stop right away. And they chill in Jerusalem. Like, they, they hear go, and they stop. And so what we read, when, when they finally get going, it's in Acts 11, now those were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and they spoke to the, the word of Jesus to no one except Jews. But among them were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to Hellenists, non-Jews, proclaiming the Lord Jesus, and, and then people start flocking, and the great number became believers. All right, so that's when it happens. What does it take for the disciples to go to another town? It takes persecution, right? They don't go until it is more uncomfortable to go than to stay. Well, let's be honest with ourselves. Change is always driven by being uncomfortable. We change when it is more uncomfortable to stay how we are than it is to change to something else. So they're chilling in Jerusalem. Jesus has said go, and they haven't. And they're chilling in Jerusalem, and it starts getting a little bit hot. They start getting persecuted. And that's when they remember, oh, Jesus did say something about this. He said we should move. Well, I guess we should get going now. And then they go. They finally get up and do what Jesus told them to do when, it's, when that is the least uncomfortable thing to do. And they go down the road. They get to Antioch. And they start telling people about Jesus. And who do they tell about Jesus? Well, listen again. Right? Traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and they spoke the word to no one except the Jews. Who did they talk to? People that were just like them, right? We got to go talk to all of the nations. Who are we going to start with? Well, let me talk to people who are, who are just like me first. Right? And then, only after what happens next do things start to change. But among some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, people who were already kind of new to the church. 
they spoke to people who weren't Jews, and then a great number became believers and turned to the Lord. Then the church starts to grow. Right? I love this. But what we see is that the disciples, they went somewhere new. They started going out to all the nations when they didn't have any other choice because it was too uncomfortable to stay. And they didn't immediately start talking to everyone they could. They started by talking to people who were they, they were most comfortable with. And then some of them led them further out and said, no, really, we got to start talking to more people. And then it's when things started to take off. And I love this because that's me. Right? Because I get comfortable. I, I, I like the, the way things are, right? I get comfortable, and, and I'll get out there to everyone else, but can I just stay right here right now? This reinforces to me my working theory of Scripture, that there are no heroes in the Bible. Well, there's one, Jesus. Everyone else, all the just normal people are just normal people who God works with and through and sometimes in spite of. And that, that's, that's what I see in, in the mirror. Because I think the same thing. You know what, Jesus, I'll get to all the nations, but let me start right here. I'll get to everyone, but let me start with the people that I'm most comfortable with. And uh, yeah, anyone else? I, I'm tempted to say, can I get an amen, but I don't want to make you uncomfortable. <laughs> What Jesus is commending to his followers is a way of life, uh, cultivating a practice of getting outside the walls and going out there and being willing to be uncomfortable because there are people who need to receive the good news, the, the amazing gift of, of Jesus Christ. And, and there was a time when the church in America was really good at this. It's back when Missouri was the West. Like, so it's been a while. If you go back to the 19th century, the, the, the practice that drove the drive of Christianity across the plains, across the West, were the great tent revivals. And, and if you think about what that was like, that was preachers from the East Coast, the comfortable, settled East Coast, who were willing to go West to be able to, to, to go West to put up these big tents and have the big revivals, because they understood that if they wanted people to experience the good news of Jesus, that's what it was going to take. They were going to have to follow all these people who were risking everything to cut farms out of the plains of the Midwest. It was a courageous thing to go west. And, and preachers followed, and the church followed, and, and every time they would pop up a tent, they would gather people, and they would tell people about the gift of salvation and forgiveness and the possibility of a transformed life following Jesus together. And isn't that exciting? Yes, come on down. Altar call. Let's start a church. And now... How many churches are there in rural Missouri? More than I could even count, right? It worked. In a sense, 19th century uh, Protestant Christianity becomes a victim of its own success because we hit 20th century Protestant American Christianity and everyone goes to church. Like, let's just imagine it's the 1950s again easier for some of us than for others. And uh, imagine that, right? 1950s, 1960s. You go back to a time, I am told, I, I wasn't around then, when if an employer and an employee were both in the same church, because everyone went to church, if the employee wasn't at church on Sunday, I'm told of times that that, that guy would get to work the next day and his boss would ask, where, where were you Sunday? Would that fly today, Tim? Would that fly? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Things changed. But there was a time in the middle part of the 20th century where everyone went to church because that's just what you did because the entire Midwest was just full of churches and they were full because the 19th century had done such a great job. And we got really comfortable. Right. What does it take to change? Like if, if 1950s, 1960s, 1970s Christianity is, is like Jerusalem in that first century, hey, this is comfortable, let's just chill here. What does it take to change? It takes being uncomfortable with the current situation. In the case of the, the first um, 
century, it was being uncomfortable because they were being actively persecuted. And, and so they, they left and, and they went out. They remember Jesus said, go, for, and go forth and do this and I will be with you and it's going to work out, so, so go. And, and in the 19th century, they, they were willing to be uncomfortable because they realized there were so many people that needed to hear the good news of Jesus, good news of Jesus that they left the East Coast and, and they came across the plains to reach people and, and, and they, they were risked being uncomfortable. Are we uncomfortable with our current situation? Are we? Think about that. Are we uncomfortable? Or are we very comfortable? When I look in the mirror and I'm honest with myself, I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm really comfortable. We get along, right? I think we get along. PPR hasn't told me anything to the contrary recently. <laughs> right? I'm comfortable here. We get along, we're doing some things together. I enjoy drinking coffee with y'all. This is, this is comfortable. And what makes me uncomfortable is thinking about where will this church be in 20 years? Right. Where will this church be in 20 years? In 20 years, can we all agree that people will still need Jesus in 20 years? Amen, right? Someone, amen. And in 20 years, if we go on the path we're on right now, that should make you a little bit uncomfortable. Makes me uncomfortable. Amen. So, what, the, what happens is some people who are thinking in all the same thoughts, back in 20, 2007, some lay leaders had gotten together from across the country and, and they were proposing something to General Conference because what they realized was, if you look at our vows of membership, what do you commit to as you're joining the church? You commit, and remember, these vows of membership come from 1969 when the Methodist Church is formed. That's when we like looked at our vows of membership and said, yes, that's what we're going to do. Um, they are prayers, presence, gifts, and service. You notice anything that's missing there? If you fulfill those four commitments, you will support the Methodist Church by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service. Have you ever talked to anyone outside the church about Jesus? Ever? No. Right? You can be a good Methodist, and in a culture where everyone comes to church because that's just what you do, it works. But things have changed. You might have noticed We're not, we don't live in the 1950s anymore. And so the, the, the realization was made. And so as of in 20, 2008, it was realized we needed to add a fifth commitment. We needed to add a commitment, prayers, presence, gifts, uh, service, and witness. We needed to figure out a way to become communities of experimentation and witness. And I say experimentation because there's what used to work, but we're not going to do a big tent revival. It'd mess up the parking lot, we'd have to drill holes in the concrete, I, there's no way we're going to do it, right? And, and it just wouldn't work. So we got to become, a, part of our commitment is to become part of a community of experimentation so that we create pathways for us to get out there and for other people to come in, to create individual events and practices so that there's an interface, so that the church is creating ways for us to do this and do so in ways that we don't feel like we're being jerks. There's that great comic where the dude's walking up to the pearly gates and the guy with the big old book, the angel, is, is saying, oh, welcome. And then the guy comes in, oh, do I get in? And the angel says, well, you did everything right. You followed Jesus, except you forgot the don't be a jerk part. You ever seen that comic? Right? How do we experiment with ways of witness so that we don't feel like we're being jerks, right? Because if you offer someone a gift, I view the church as this huge gift. How do we wrap it in the big old bow and give it away and give it away in such a way that you don't feel like you're being a jerk because you're not going to do it. We're Midwesterners. We're too polite for that. <laughs> So what do we do? We have to start to experiment. We have to start building these like on ramps to, to, for people to get in and places where we can get out. Like we, we do Bible studies here. What if we never did a Bible study in the church again and we did every Bible study ever over at Martha's? What would that look like? 
Right? If you were going to invite someone, you were going to say, "Let's start, we're, we're getting together some friends to, to read Matthew, because we're fascinated by this, do some Bible study. Would, would you like to join me at the church? You think someone... Exactly! That's perfect! Bible study at the tavern! I will study the Bible anywhere, and if you want to go over to the bar and do, I hear they have a great burger. It actually is pretty good. I will study the Bible, I don't like beer, but I will study the Bible over a rum and coke with anyone, right? If I tell you, I, my pastor is going to drink some rum and cokes and, and, and try to figure out Revelation, will you come join us? Would, 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 that, would you do that? <laughs> I will. This fall. It'll be great. Let's talk about Revelations. I'd like a double. Uh, I only ever drink one in the evening. It just, it's too expensive. But the point being, like, if we study the Bible in here, that's nice. If we study the Bible out there, you can invite people and you don't feel like you're being a jerk. Right? Like, we could have a meal for the community. Like, we talk about grace. And, and that's wonderful. But grace means free. And free has to have some meat on it. And, and so, what, how can we experiment? Well, what are we doing next Sunday? I'll tell you that I'm praying for not to rain fervently. Because if I invite someone to, to say, we're doing a fish fry, and we are, and it's going to be inside the church, that's nice. But if you go to your neighbor and say, we're doing a fish fry, come to the parking lot and bring a lawn chair, do you think that's an easier thing to say? And then what happens? Like, these are just two ideas. They're my ideas, which means they're exact worth two cents, if that. But, like, if we experiment with these things, and maybe they work and maybe they don't. I have face-planted for Jesus before. I might be about to again. Uh, if we try them, what will people start to see of this church? They will drive by, and right now, what do they see? But what do they see if year after year after year, they know that that is the place where once a year they're going to have a great time, where grace is not something abstract, but it is amazing fried fish, because the Legion really knows how to fry some fish, and, and good country music, and a good time with friends. And, and this is the church, well, some people like fried fish. I'm sorry, Michelle, we'll do something else for you next time. Okay. <laughs> But, and people drive by the church and they don't just see the church, but they see, oh, that's the church where we've chatted at Martha's or the bar or wherever. That's the church that gets outside. And then we say, can you come join us with Easter? Like, here's the thing. If you invite your neighbors, here's how you invite someone. You say, I'll pick you up or I'll meet you there and I'll sit with you. Because what are people afraid of? They're afraid of sitting by themselves. If I see any of you sitting next to each other next Sunday, you have failed. <laughs> sit next to the person you invite. Don't you dare sit next to someone in this room. You have every Sunday to do that. Next Sunday, you sit next to someone you invite. And then one day when they are looking for a place to worship for Easter, or you invite them to Easter, you say, we got some great music. And you say, I'll pick you up and I'll sit next to you. They'll believe it because you've already done it. Right? Amen. You see how this starts to shift? Like, witness is not me giving you a bunch of tracks and saying, go throw it at people and pester people into coming to worship every Sunday. It won't work. Witness is being a community that is willing to experiment with ways for us to get out there so that people might understand what a gift it is to be in here. Let me end by pointing to the table. There's a table in front of your bulletin. It is a picture of my dining room table, as clean as it's ever been, because that is the advertisement for it at Oak Woods Furniture. Uh, they make great furniture. Uh, and at that table, Olivia sits at the head of the table, and I sit to her left, and that's how we sat for years. We'd eat dinner together, right? And then Sophia came along, and she sits to the right of 
of Olivia. And I remember the first time that Olivia ate something I made and enjoyed it. Like I, I made baby food for her, and so she fed, ate pureed car carrots, but I'm not quite sure that really counts as food. The first time I made her something that she liked, I made grits, which is the South's answer to baked potatoes, because I made grits and I had shredded cheddar and shredded Parmesan, and I cooked them in cream and chicken broth and caramelized onions and garlic and cracked black pepper and bacon and garlic and, and, and there, ha there were some grits in there too, I'm sure. And, and uh, she, sat that, she sat right there uh, on that side of the table and she started eating them and just sucking them down. She loved her bits, couldn't quite get the GR out. And, uh, and I thought, this is good. Right? And, and I could not imagine not sitting here and, and, and Olivia and, and Sophia and eating together at the table. Right? We added someone and I couldn't imagine not having. And, and then Fletcher comes along and, and I, I moved down a seat because Fletcher sits to Olivia's left and Sophia's over there. And, and uh, so I gave up my seat for a new person at the table. And, uh, and, and I remember like when he started eating, my wife makes a, cheese, a, a pizza and for my son, he'll make, she'll make uh, cheese sticks. He doesn't like tomato sauce, and I'm very confused by this. But um, my wife will make homemade cheese sticks, and he just sucks those down. You know how boys eat. You look up, you look down, it's gone. Yeah, inhales them. It's amazing. And I, I couldn't imagine, I could never have guessed it would be like to have someone else at the table. But in retrospect, I can't imagine being at the table without him. Right? This is our, our table. And... Two years ago, next Sunday, I came here and I'd never been to this table with you. And now I can't imagine being at this table without you, all y'all, right? And that's how it is when it comes to witness and growing as a family, as a, as a church family. We, we invite people because we offer them the gift of forgiveness, of salvation, of community, of friendship, of a place at the table. and. They join us as they accept that gift in the same way that that family grows. Like you can, all of you have had the experience of having a family grow, and you would never imagine what it would be like before you had that child or that grandchild, but now you can't imagine being at the table without them. Right? That, that's, what, that's why we do this. We are out witnessing, experimenting in ways to do this, experimenting with levels of being uncomfortable. Some of us are willing to be more uncomfortable than others. I know that. Some of you will invite your friends. Some of you will invite the people that you meet in the grocery store tomorrow for the first time. Do them both, right? We have various levels of capability of, of being uncomfortable, but this is what we're committing to as we join the Methodist Church, to be a part of a community of experimentation that builds on ramps so that we can go out, risking being uncomfortable so that people can come in and join us at the table. And if we try something and it doesn't work, we face plant for Jesus, it's okay. We forgive each other, we stand up, and we'll try it again, knowing that Jesus has been given all authority. It's going to work out. In the end, we know the answer. We know this, the how it's, it's just a matter of how do we get points on the board. We're going to win, right? And so that's it, right? That is our, our commitment as followers of Jesus. That's our commitment. As, as me, that's our, the methods of following Jesus of Methodism. And, and I want to give you an opportunity to, to take something home and reflect on this. Um, Thank you. And so here's a sheet that has the, the four commitments, prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And I invite you to take these home and fill them out. And I've got to take some time and do it myself so that we, we know what we're doing. So that Sunday by Sunday, we know that we are moving the ball down the field as we pray for the church consistently, as we are present as we can be, as we're offering of our gifts, as we're serving those who are in need, as we're getting out the door to be willing to be uncomfortable so that others might have the ultimate comfort to the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. I invite you to turn with me to page 38 of your hymnal. Right there in the middle of the page. That's our commitment.
please join with me one more time as we recommit ourselves. As members of this congregation, will each of you full, faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, answer, I will. Amen. And now let us stand and join together as we confess together our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 